Good afternoon again to those of you that have, have just joined. Uh, thank you so much for coming along today. If this is the first session um, in this series of personal injury claims in Scotland that you have attended, then welcome. I hope it's useful. Um, if you have attended previous sessions, then thank you for coming back. Um, as you'll see on the screen today, Katie and I are going to cover four topics. And when we were planning this series of webinars, the four topics that are on the screen that we're going to speak about, uh, quantum and fatal claims, expert evidence, occupier's liability and risk assessments, uh, these were mentioned not only because of recent cases of interest, um, but also because they are four of the areas that we are most recently asked about by our clients. But we didn't consider that the developments in each of these areas was such that they warranted individual sessions. Um, but if after today you think that you and your team would benefit from digging into more detail on one or more of the topics, um, and perhaps even going back to, to basics, please do let us know. We would be delighted to discuss those with you um, and we could look to pull together a bespoke session for you. So I'm now going to hand over to Katie and she's going to start us off with quantum in fatal claims. Yes, thanks, Laura. Um, and hello, everyone on, on the webinar. Yes, so the, the first topic that we're going to be considering today is, is fatal claims and in particular, uh, recent cases relating to the level of awards made for loss of society. So firstly, and I suppose as a, a quick reminder, you know, what, what is loss of society? Well, under this head of claim, family members of a, a deceased person who dies due to the negligence of a third party can claim compensation for the, the loss of that familial relationship. Whilst we refer to these claims generally as loss of society claims, actually that terminology is is slightly misleading as in fact the the loss of society element is is only one of three strands to the award and we can see that from from the wording of the the relevant act um so if we just move on to the, the next slide we'll we'll see that um so this is the, the the statutory scheme for awarding damages for fatal accident claims in scotland it is set out in the damages scotland act 2011 um, and, and the relevant section uh, section 43b of the act is set out for you on the slide now and you can see there the, the two other strands to consider and um, which are distress in contemplation of the family members suffering before their death um, and the grief and sorrow caused by the death so that's your your three strands to, to loss of society as we call it um, the act entitles a wide range of relatives to claim for loss of society and that includes individuals who were treated as members of the deceased's family but not biologically or legally related to them. There is, in theory, no limit to the, the sum of money that can be sought for loss of society. Um, and the Act doesn't explicitly state how such awards should be calculated. Um, the value will depend on the individual facts and circumstances of each case. Uh, by way of brief comparison, uh, in England and Wales, although bereavement awards can be sought under the Fatal Accidents Act 1976, the amount of money that can be claimed is far lower. It's fixed by the statute um, and the pool of relatives entitled to claim is far smaller. So um, given that the, the, the Act, the 2011 Act, does not provide any guidance on how these claims should be valued, it can be challenging to predict what any given claim might be worth. However, by considering recent case law, we can identify a number of factors that will impact the level of awards, and those factors are on your screen just now. So, as I'm sure many of you will know, loss of society claims in Scotland can be determined by a judge or a jury. Um, there had been a general trend for juries to make sometimes much higher awards than judges. However, following the, the 2012 case of Hamilton against Ferguson Transport, now greater direction is given to juries by judges and judges in turn also have to have regard to the level of jury awards when they are deciding the level of damages in the case. 
in any event, and regardless of whether we're talking about an award made by a judge or by a jury, there are several other factors to be considered. So the first is the, the age of the deceased. Um, it will be relevant uh, with pursuers claiming for the wrongful death of a relatively young family member generally awarded more than those who claim whose claim relates to the death of a, a more elderly loved one. Uh, in the recent case of, of MacArthur and others against Timberbush Tours Limited, a case we'll, we'll touch on a couple of times, um, the court placed special significance on the deceased's relative youth. He was 26 at the time of his death. Uh, similarly, younger pursuers are likely to be awarded more for loss of society than older pursuers. In uh, Jennifer McCulloch and others uh, versus Fourth Valley Health Board uh, 2020 decision, Lord Tyre suggested that younger children who have lost a parent should be entitled to higher levels of compensation than older children due to missing out on, on more time with the deceased. Cases such as the, the MacArthur decision I've already mentioned also demonstrate the importance that the nature of the relationship between the deceased and the pursuer will play in the level of loss of society award with, with the court awarding substantial compensation if it can be demonstrated that the bond was particularly close. And, and finally, and, and reflecting that third strand of, of loss of society awards we, we touched on earlier, the nature of the deceased's death can also be a factor where the deceased has experienced significant pain and suffering prior to death, the court may take this into account and any loss of society award will, will likely be higher. Um, the recent case of Patterson and others against Lanarkshire Health Board, this is a, a case from earlier this year, provided some further guidance as to how these various factors outlined may impact on the level of loss of society awards made. Patterson concerned the, the tragic death of a 30-year-old Miss Lynette Giblin, who had an extensive history of mental illness and who committed suicide following discharge from hospital, where she had been detained under a short-term detention certificate. The case was brought by a number of family members, namely the deceased's mother, her two children and two siblings. And the court found that there had been a failing in the care received by Mrs Giblin following her discharge, finding in favour of the pursuers and making awards totalling £250,000 for loss of society under the 2011 Act. Um, the sums awarded to the individual pursuers are set out for you on the screen there. So what further guidance can be taken from the awards made in this case? Well, Firstly, the award made to the deceased's mother in Patterson, £100,000, that's the, the first pursuer, equals the highest figure previously awarded to a parent to date for loss of society. A previous award of 100000 was also made in the MacArthur case to the parents of, of the deceased there. Um, it's also worth noting that in both of those cases, the deceased was young um, and the circumstances of the death particularly traumatic, which, which impacted on the figures awarded. Um, in terms of the, the, the awards made to the children, in, in Patterson, the deceased's two children were aged 13 and 15 at the date of their mother's death, and each child was awarded 70,000. That's the, the fourth and fifth pursuer. And again, this was consistent with the awards made in McCulloch, in which the deceased's stepson, also aged 13 at the date of his father's death, was awarded £70,000. Patterson also reaffirms the position that the nature of the pursuer's relationship to the deceased will be of particular importance. In his judgment, uh, the Lord Ordinary described the pursuer as a, a most affectionate and dutiful daughter to her beloved mother, with the deceased's children described as equally beloved. However, the deceased was noted as being sadly estranged from her siblings, and the second uh, that's the second and, and third pursuers. And when giving evidence, the, the second pursuer struggled to remember the time of year his sister had died. And it was noted that there was a 16-year a age gap between the deceased and the third pursuer who had not lived with the deceased for a very long time. Both of them were awarded only £5,000, which is very much at the lower end of awards for siblings.
Finally, in Patterson, the Lord Ordinary took into account the deceased's mother's considerable distress and anxiety in contemplation of the deceased's suffering before her death, noting that her grief had manifested in an extremely physical way, that the first pursuer actually collapsed when the deceased was taken to hospital. And again, this is consistent with the approach taken in previous cases, such as in MacArthur, where the violent manner of the deceased's death was considered when valuing the claim. So what conclusions can we reach from this most recent decision? Well, following Patterson, it, it remains the case that quantifying loss of society claims is not an exact science. Indeed, in reaching his final decision, the judge in Patterson acknowledged that he took a broad brush approach to valuing the claim. Uh, the value of any potential award will depend heavily on the nuances of an individual case, and, and that can be difficult to assess prior to proof. Um, information gathering is key, albeit investigating fatal claims is, is just not often very straightforward. So certain assumptions may have to be made regarding the nature of familial relationships based on known facts. So, for example, if the family member lives close to the deceased or, or if they feature in the medical records as attending appointments, they may be me mentioned in any benefits application, for example. There is no obligation on the pursuer's solicitor, solicitor to provide statements, um, but those can be requested and, and are, are, are often provided. Um, nonetheless, Patterson confirms that the factors we've discussed today it can provide useful guidance to insurers when setting reserves and, and attempting to predict the extent of any financial liability in a fatal claim. And on that note, I'm going to hand back over to Laura to take us on to our next topic. Thank you very much, Katie. Um, I am now going to move on to the questions all about experts. So um, our topic um, is headed expert or not. Um, and we're going to look at it in the context of one case in particular that may have um, come across your uh, desk already. Um, but just before we do that, I thought it would be helpful to touch on the sort of underlying principles on the duties and role of the expert witness and the admissibility of their evidence in a Scottish court action. Now, in Scots law, an expert's duties are not set down by statute um, in the way that they are in England and Wales. But nevertheless, the duties uh, of an expert in a Scottish case are very much the same. And, and indeed, the Scottish courts have adopted the principles which were set out in the English Icarian Reefer case back in 1993. And those are listed on the slide. Um, and in terms of the expert's duties, the Acadian Reefer case set out six main duties. The first one being that the expert should be uninfluenced by the demands of litigation. Um, they should be objective and unbiased in their opinion. They should um, give that opinion on matters within their expertise only. They shouldn't assume the role of an advocate and um, in the case I'm going to go on and talk about, one of the, the ways that the, the judge in that case described it was that an expert has to know that they are not on the claimant's team or they're not on the defendant's team. Um, their primary role, um, as you'll see at the bottom of the slide there, is to assist the court in making a decision. Um, and sometimes experts, as we'll see, can come unstuck on that. Um, in terms of any facts or assumptions that an expert is making, those should be stated um, in the report or in their oral evidence. Um, but in addition to that, if there are any material facts which detract from their opinion, then they should be addressing those head on. So they shouldn't be swept under the carpet, they shouldn't be ignored, they should be addressed in the report, even if they are unhelpful. Um, Experts should be highlighting where a matter falls outside their expertise. And I think for those of you who are used to dealing with, for example, um, orthopaedic um, expert reports, you'll often see there's a psychiatric element to that. That's outside my expertise. And I think where it's as um, clear as that, um, there's not usually a problem. I think sometimes it's where it's more nuanced that the expert perhaps doesn't realise that they are overstepping the mark. And again, um, we'll see an example of that in a moment. 
an opinion um, which can't be finalised because there's a lack of data should be stated as provisional. Um, and with that, I just wanted to mention my own experience recently of a case which involved an employment expert instructed by the um, pursuer. And in that report, there was, uh, I think in total, about 15 years of missing data um, in terms of the pursuer's earnings income because he had been self-employed during that period. So quite a chunky um, period of time. Um, we had information from prior to his self-employed period and post self-employed period, but there was a big gap in the middle. Now the expert in that case was never tested because the case settled as the vast majority do, um, but I thought it was interesting and slightly concerning that although the expert was clear to point out that there was data that was missing um, and and that you know that data might be available nevertheless was content to give a final decision a final conclusion on what the pursuer's loss of earnings um was or, or would have been you know what his income would have been but for the for the accident um so i, I just thought i'd mention that because i think it's quite a stark example of where an expert flagged the lack of data um, but then didn't consider that it was an obstacle to him making a coming to a conclusion about what the, the loss of earnings actually was. And then finally, if there's a change in the expert's view, then that has to be communicated without delay. And depending on the stage that the court action is at, that communication may be to the instructing solicitors, it may be to the instructing insurers, it may be to the court. Um, but it should be um, given um, as soon as possible. In terms of the admissibility of evidence, I just wanted to mention it here for completeness. Um, we're not dealing with it in any great detail today. Um, you will be familiar with that, I'm sure, when most commonly um, when a uh, we're looking at whether or not a particular expert should be certified as a skilled witness, as they're known in Scotland. Um, and so we look at the principles that were set down in the Kennedy Cordia Supreme Court case. We uh, look at the questions of did the um, evidence assist the court? Um, did the expert have the necessary knowledge and experience to be considered an expert? Were they impartial? Um, and was there a reliable body of knowledge underpinning their evidence? Um, and that argument can also be taken if you're actually going to, to trial, if you're going to, to proof, if an expert is um, going to give evidence and you think that they are not a proper expert because they don't um, meet one of these, um, one of the four prongs of this test. Um, and I've mentioned already, um, but just to reiterate that the expert needs to, to remember that their role is to assist the court in making a decision. Um, and I'm sure many of you will be familiar um, with the cases over the last few years that have been highly critical of experts overstepping the mark um, and seeking to usurp the um, court's function as the, the decision maker. So moving on then to the case I was speaking about, I mean, it's been described as a seminal case um, for, for more than one reason. Um, it is a really interesting case. It's a long read. Um, you might have seen some of the, the highlights summarized um, for different reasons because um, it was a case that was dismissed on the grounds of fundamental dishonesty. So it was significant um, in that sense. It was a claim for just shy of three million pounds. Um, it was an English case, but as I say, um, given the alignment between the um, approach to experts north and south of the border, um, I think it's still a, a significant case um, for those of us practising in Scotland. And the other very interesting uh, elements to this case, which are um, relevant for today's discussion, are the criticisms that the, the Judge Justice Cotter made of both the claimant's care expert and the employment expert. 
And going back to the Icarian reefer principles, which which do when you actually start look at look at it, they do kind of um, cross over each other. Um, but the, broadly, the criticisms of the experts um, in this case were that they were biased, um, they were um, partisan, um, in favour of the claimant. They um, failed to include material facts, which detracted from their opinion. Um, and they also failed to change their view in light of um, evidence that came to light after they had provided their initial opinions. So if we move on to the next slide, you'll see why those images are not just random images. Um, they are actually relevant um, to the criticisms. So the claimants here expert, um, these are kind of just three of the kind of uh, the most stark, I think, um, recommendations that the claimant expert made um, that were um, criticised by Justice Cotter. The first one being that she suggested that in her report that the claimant should get a reclining chair um, and that he should have that in order to be able to stretch his back out. Um, however, the claimant did not have a back injury and nor did he have any back symptoms um, which had um, been caused by his uh, his injuries. She was not able to um, support that um, position when she was uh, giving evidence. She also recommended that the claimant should have a whirlpool, um, which was uh, a cost of, or would have been a cost of £10,000 um, had it been allowed. Um, but there was no explanation in her, her report as to why she thought a whirlpool would be um, helpful to um, Mr. Newper. And then the the final one that I wanted to highlight here was she suggested that when he was going on a on holiday, for example, that there should be a pre-flight cabin assessment to make sure that he is um he, you know that it was um suitable for him to be able to travel. Um, and you'll see the comment on that slide there that um it suggests that was ridiculous. That was not the judge, that was the expert who in the witness box conceded that actually that suggestion was a ridiculous one. Um, so as I said, it wasn't just the care expert that came under very heavy fire. The employment um, expert did as well. Um, and one of the examples here is where it, which which really kind of helps to highlight how he was trying desperately to um, find evidence or make inferences that uh, were supportive of the claimant. So this is in relation to um, some surveillance footage, which I'll, I'll talk about a bit more in a second. Um, but he, what the claimant's employment expert said was that he noted that he was wearing thick soled training shoes and sports socks compared with others in the clip who were wearing sandals or flip-flops without socks. And he said it could be inferred from that, that Mr. Mupa's need to keep his feet warm and cushioned was far greater than others in the clip. And what the Justice Cotter said in response to that is, nobody else had ever suggested this was why the claimant was dressed as he was. And in my judgment, this was a clear example of Mr. Craggs, the employment expert, straining to find an explanation that could assist the claimant. Um, so this is this is a really stark example, um, both in terms of the employment expert and in terms of the, the care expert, of um, experts going wrong. But I think for that reason, it's actually a really good case because it shows you really clear examples of um, when an expert is overstepping the mark. And in other cases, as I said, it can be a bit more grey. Um, but actually, when you look at this case and you can see the principles in action, I think it's really helpful to then be able to look at it in your own cases. Um, and I'm going to come on um, and offer a few tips in that regard. So finally, on if we go into the next slide, finally on this um, fascinating case, um, I wanted just to, to mention the fact that, that neither of the experts um, felt that they required to change their opinions, despite the fact that the defendants had um, obtained surveillance evidence, which showed um, that the claimant could actually do a lot more than he claimed he could do, that actually his 
uh, functional restrictions were much lower um, than he had suggested. So he was seen to be dancing um, and he was seen to be standing at the bar for lengthy periods of time. Um, he'd maintained that you know his mobility was really restricted. He couldn't stand for a long periods of time. He required to, to walk with a stick and the surveillance uh, very clearly contradicted that. Um, and neither the care expert or the employment expert um, revised their views. And the care expert, there was a little bit of a focus on her because when she gave evidence, it, it was um, sort of, I think maybe 10 days after the surveillance evidence had been um, shown to, to the court. Um, but but she still didn't um, change her view. And, and the judge was really critical of her for that because she'd had ample time to go back and revisit and what she had said originally. And similarly, the employment expert um, didn't feel that he required to alter his opinion, even though um, the surveillance showed something quite different from what he'd been told by the claimant in his statement. And one of the other things that the employment expert did was that he ignored um, material facts that would have um, been unhelpful to his ultimate opinion. So he, essentially what he said was that the um, claimant, but for the accident, would have um, stayed in the army for um, a full 20 years. But he ignored factors such as um, the, the statistical evidence that around 50% um, of people in the army will leave before that 20 year period. And there were other things around about the claim that he'd, you know, he'd not gone on tours that he'd been asked to go to. He had a disabled child. Other factors which suggested that he was not uh, going to see out the 20 years but for, for the accident. But again, the, the employment expert had just um, sort of buried that under the carpet. Um, and so if we move on to, to the next uh, slide, I want you just to kind of pull that together in terms of avoiding pitfalls, because when we're looking at expert witnesses, um, and when many of you are too, it's twofold. It's one, do we need an expert witness? Um, if we're instructing them, are we doing everything right? If we are um, leading evidence from them in court, are we doing everything right? But also looking at it in the context of well, when can we object to um, the other side's expert evidence. So it, it's sort of wearing both hats. But when you are instructing an expert yourself, um, I've highlighted some of the kind of key points here. Um, and I think it's worth revisiting that throughout the duration of, um, of a claim. So if you instruct an expert at the start, um, it is worthwhile thinking throughout the duration of the claim is there anything that I need to do? Do they remain the right expert? Do they have all of the information that they should have? Has Have things materially changed? Um, and should I make them aware of that? So making sure you've got the right expert. Um, it sounds simple, um, but sometimes, um, you know, it, it can be actually quite, quite tricky. Um, and Katie and I have been wrangling with that in a, a case recently, in a, in a marine case, in terms of identifying the correct expert. I think one of the things that is useful to do if it's perhaps not clear um, or it's so niche that trying to find somebody with expertise in that area is difficult is actually to speak to the experts who so don't just take their you know website profile or their CV as read, um, but actually to speak to them in advance of giving them instruction just to satisfy yourself that they can actually um, provide a report and that they do have the expertise to do that. Um, and also, I would say that one of the other things I think is undervalued <clears throat> is how worthwhile a comparator can be. Um, it may be that actually you don't need an expert. You just need somebody else who does that job day in, day out. Um, and, you know, so don't, so don't rule that out because they, if they're, you know, at the cold face doing the job, then they may be better placed than, than um, somebody who's sitting behind a desk. Um, do they have a balanced practice? So the claimant's uh, care expert in the MUPA case um, was criticised because she had, I think, exclusively worked for um, claimants. So you're better uh, looking at experts who have done um, work on both sides. Um, on the face of it, they will be more objective and they actually should be more objective. Um, I've mentioned making sure that you provide them with all of the information um, because what you don't want is them to be presented with information at trial that they haven't seen before that materially alters their position, um, such as surveillance. Um, 
making sure that you've got an appropriate instruction as well. And I think that's really important because if you are um, further down the line, if there are question marks over the admissibility of their evidence, or indeed, um, as often happens, the expert themselves repeats the questions that you've asked them in their report, you want to make sure that you're not trying to put words in their mouth um, and that you're actually asking um, the correct objective questions yourself. Um, and that links to the caution around requested amendment. Um, again, I, I've had experience, thankfully not my own, of um, a, a case where a solicitor's firm came unstuck because they required to produce the instructions that they had given to an expert when they were asking them to change their report. And it showed that they were um, trying to unduly influence that expert in terms of what they wanted them to say. Um, be critical when you're looking at any reports um, as well. I think sometimes, particularly if experts are using um, fancy language, um, that you know it can be it can seem overwhelming to try to to critique a report to make sure that actually they're doing their job. Um, but I don't think that can be um, underestimated how important it is to actually look at the report, not just take the conclusion as read, and actually make sure that you're content that the expert um, has reached the conclusions on the the right basis. Um, and finally, if there's supportive data that is relied upon by the expert, ask them to produce that. Um, I've mentioned um, in a webinar previously about um, the expert who had relied on um, a particular piece of literature that was in French, produced that French piece of literature, um, and then transpired that he didn't speak French. So he clearly um, couldn't say whether or not that piece um, of literature did support his view. So that's all I really wanted to say about experts um, in the context of the MUPA decision from last year. Um, I'm going to move on uh, briefly to talk about occupiers liability. This is a case where um, I'm going to focus on here, where actually um, the admissibility of the um, evidence from the expert was also hotly contested. So um, I'm not going to look at that aspect of the case today. But again, if you're interested, it's worth looking at the case um, from that angle as well. So before I do that, um, just briefly to look at the Occupiers Liability Scotland Act 1960, that's the Scottish equivalent of the 1957 Act in England and Wales. This act um, is essentially the same as the common law. We do still have the common law, but they're basically the same now, the common law and the statute of provisions in relation to an occupier's uh, duties of care towards anyone who is coming on to their uh, premises um, and it's such care as in all circumstances is reasonable to see that the person will not suffer any injury or damage and occupiers don't need to be um, physically um, in, on the premises at the time, they just need to be able to exert a level of control over the premises um, at the time of the accident. So you may have a situation where there's more than one occupier. So just with that, having looked at that brief framework, I want to move on to the um, actual case um, that I want to talk about, which is Forest Against Iceland Foods Limited from 2021. Um, now, this is a decision of the All Scotland Personal Injury Court. Um, I'm going to uh, you know, say up front here that I don't think it was the right decision, um, but I'm also going to say I may not be objective because the solicitor advocate for the defender is also a friend. So, um, I'm, yeah, I'm doing my expert duty um, uh, here and saying that I'm not necessarily fully objective on this one, but you can make up your own mind about it. Um, so in this case, the pursuer had tri tripped over a ramp, which is pretty small in that picture, but maybe when you get the uh, slides through, you'll be able to, to see it um, outside the entrance to an Iceland store, and she fractured her knee and her wrist. Um, she'd visited the, the shop twice before. Um, it was accepted that she would have negotiated the ramp um, twice before, um, park, parked her car in the car park, and then... Um, negotiated the ramp before going inside. It was also undisputed evidence um, that maybe about a million uh, customers had traversed the ramp. Um, there had been no reported incident in the five years prior to her accident. Um, 
And uh, it was also um, a sort of key fact that other nearby shops with similar ramps had installed handrails or low walls. Um, the decision in this case I thought was interesting because it was found that the ramp was a hazard. Um, so notwithstanding the fact that there had been around about a million people who'd managed to negotiate it fine before, including the pursuer herself on a couple of occasions, um, the, the sheriff felt that it was something that the store should have done something about. It was a hazard that presented a foreseeable risk of injury and therefore they should have installed a handrail or low wall or indeed have painted it. And had they done so, the pursuer would not have tripped and fallen. So there was a 25% contributory negligence deduction there. Um, the decision in this case, where I can see where the sheriff was coming from, was that he said that the ramp wasn't easy to discern because it was the same um, material as the, the rest of the car park. To me, it was an obvious hazard um, that ought to have been seen and obviously had been seen by others. But um, who am I to uh, contradict um, a sheriff? But the question that he asked himself in this case, and I think, again, when looking at occupiers' liability cases, if you have any, was, was a reasonable and probable consequence of failing to take remedial action harm to the pursuer? So it was looking at the question almost backwards. So looking at what the remedial action could have been and was reasonable, and then deciding whether a failure to take that action was um, potentially going to cause harm to the, the pursuer. So rather than identifying, was this a danger? What should we have done? It was looking at it from the, what we what could we have done? Um, and by failing to do that, did it present a risk of harm to the pursuer? Now these cases are inherently tricky. And I suppose the kind of one takeaway from this forest case is that they're really, really difficult cases. Um, so if we move on to the to the next and, and last slide uh, for me in this, um, a case which which conflicts with um, the Forest case um, is McKevitt. And I think it's a good example of where the courts will always say when it comes to occupier's liability and other uh, legal concepts as well, that each case turns on its own facts. I would say quite often it turns on the judge um, who's on the, the bench on the day. So there are so many similarities between McKevitt and Forrest. And McKevitt was put to, to the sheriff in Forrest, but he said each case turns on its own facts. So I'm not going to, to read into to the McKevitt decision too far. Um, but in McKevitt, um, a woman fell over a, a stone path and it was it was determined that that wasn't um, a hazard um, that the uh, National Trust ought to have done anything about. Slight distinction in that case, the, the sheriff found that it wasn't an obscured um, you know, uh, or, or hidden danger, um, but it was covered in lichen, you know, it was, you know, it, and it was the same-ish material as the rest of, of the path. So worth a read um, if you want to see both those um, sort of cases and how the sheriffs inter interpreted them differently. But what our kind of takeaway for you in terms of advice is taking on board this point about own facts is that I think it's really important to look at the facts and actually start to kind of incrementally put the facts together that might support your defence. So what is the exact mechanism of the accident? We need to understand exactly what caused the pursuer to fall and where he or she fell. Um, contemporaneous account of what happened. Did they slip? Did they trip? Um, actually understanding what they said at the time rather than what they might say later because it's it's convenient. Understanding the weather, um, was that a factor? Was the lighting a factor? Um, and also considering what the cost of remedial action was because the coach will still take that into account if the remedial action is um, too expensive um, to actually implement. So it's collecting that um, information right at the start. I think it's really important to put yourself in the best position to defend an occupier's liability claim. And one of the other things that the courts will look at is actually the assessment of the level of risk. Um, 
accepting that someone might trip over a ramp, might trip over a stone, um, but actually um, what is the likelihood of that risk eventuating? And so with that, I'm going to hand over to Katie to finish on risk assessing. Thank you, Laura. Nice segue indeed. Uh, <laughs> yes, <clears throat> excuse me. Often, as Laura's pointed out, you know, so often the question of whether an activity was properly risk, risk assessed um, will be crucial in, in the determination of liability. And there are numerous examples in case law where courts have found defenders' assessments to, to be lacking um, and have, have found against them for, for that reason or, or, or partly for that reason. Um, but we're going to look now at two recent cases where actually ultimately the court accepted that the risk had been properly assessed by the defenders and think about what we can take away from those cases. So the first case is that of Mackenzie against the Highland Council. Um, this case involved a primary school teacher who was injured during a physical activity training session, so a CPD event that had been run uh, by her employer, the Highland Council. Uh, the accident happened whilst she was participating in a game of alligator tag. Those not familiar with that game, much like myself, it, it turns out it's like any normal game of tag, except when the tag participants there when when they are tagged participants assume the press up position until released by another team member so the pursuer was playing the role of the tag air um, and collided or tripped over another participant who had been tagged and was was on the ground doing their press up <clears throat> excuse me uh, so participation in the game was voluntary and the, the teacher in charge of the training course who was a Ms Young had conducted similar courses previously before the game began, she warned those participating to take care, to be aware of their surroundings. And similarly, the event organiser, a Mr. Holmes, had previously undergone risk assessment training. So he was familiar with the school where the event was being run, and he'd identified a tarmac area as opposed to a grassy area as being suitable for the game. Now, that was was because partly because the grassy area was slippy um, and also he was aware that not all the teachers who would be participating had access to grassed areas at their own schools. So a risk assessment was prepared by Mr Holmes and he identified the risks of slips, trips and falls and also the risk of staff colliding during the game. Um, having considered the nature of the activity and the fact that this was a game involving adults and was not or I assume was not meant to be competitive. Um, the the risk of staff colliding was assessed as being unlikely. However, um, the pursuer argued that her employers had failed to assess and reduce the risk involved to its lowest reasonably practicable level. Expert evidence uh, was led for both parties and the pursuer's expert opinion was that the risk of the collision between participants was greater than Mr Holmes had assessed it at and that either the game could have been played at a walking pace or those tagged could have moved to the side to assume their press up position. The defenders expert however took the view that if played at walking pace, and I can I can see where this view comes from, it, it would no longer be a, a game. Um, and that the participants congregating at the side actually could be a, an increased risk factor. It could increase the risk of injury and cause confusion about who was tagged um, and, uh, and who was actually still playing the game. So um, the case proceeded to the All Scotland Sheriff Personal Injury Court and following evidence, Sheriff Campbell KC found in favour of the defender. Um, he held that they had not breached either their common law duty uh, as, a, as an employer, nor their duties as an occupier under the, the 1960 Act. Um, and as you can see from the quote on the screen, Sheriff Campbell was satisfied that the participants had been warned to be aware of their surroundings. And so it was reasonable to expect them to take care and to, to use common sense. And crucially, he found that in completing the risk assessment, Mr. Holmes had properly considered the risk of a collision between participants occurring. And so the risk assessment was adequate for this particular training session. The next case we're going to consider is another case where, where the court took a similar approach to 
an assessment of the adequacy of risk assessment, and it's that of Warner v Scapaflow Charters. Um, now, this is a case where, where Brodies were involved. We acted for the defender, and um, I assisted partner Carly Forrest in, in this one. So it's, it's one I know very well. Um, the case centred on the tragic death of Mr Lex Warner who had died whilst taking part in a deep sea technical dive. He was a, a very experienced technical diver and he was a member of the Dark Star group of divers. Um, the group had chartered the Defender's vessel, the Jean Elaine, to take them out to the site of the wreck that they were intending to dive. <clears throat> Prior to entering the water, uh, Mr. Warner was walking across the deck of the vessel in heavy diving gear and he tripped and fell on the deck. Uh, unbeknownst to him, he sustained a, a serious injury to his liver. Uh, he elected to continue with the dive, but during his descent got into difficulty and attempted a rapid ascent um, at, and, and drowned. Um, the, the pursuers argued three grounds of fault against the defenders. Um, firstly, that they failed to carry out a suitable risk assessment. And in particular, um, in respect of persons walking on the deck in diving equipment, and particularly in, in fins, um, if you can imagine kind of what you probably would imagine as, as being on the, the feet of divers. Um, secondly, that there were insufficient handrails to assist the deceased when he was moving across the deck to the exit point for the dive in his kit. Um, and that thirdly, the defenders should have had a system which directed the divers not to walk across the deck when wearing fins. Um, the defender's position was that while there was no written risk assessment, Mr Cuthbertson, who was the, the skipper of the vessel, had assessed the risks on board, um, including to the divers as they walked across the deck to the exit point, and as a result had provided handrails and offered the assistance of a deck hand. Again, this is a case where expert evidence was led for both parties, but evidence was also led from, from a number of, of other members of the Dark Star group, um, so the, the diving group, the group of technical divers, and they gave evidence as to what they considered to be best practice in terms of kitting up and walking across the deck to the, to the exit point. They spoke highly of Mr Cuthbertson, um, they can. They said they had, they had no concerns relating to the safety of the vessel or indeed his operation of it. Nonetheless, at first instance, the Lord Ordinary found fault on the part of the defenders in respect of both the risk assessment and the systems case. And in particular, he found that the risk assessment failed to identify that walking on deck and fins was inherently risky. Um, the case was appealed to the inner house and on appeal, the inner house found that the Lord Ordinary had erred in the balancing exercise carried out between the risk of the accident occurring and the seriousness of any potential injury, the practicality of any specific precaution and the effect of any prohibition on the activity in question. Um, and in particular, the inner house found that Lord Ordinary had failed to give weight to the evidence of the divers, who the court considered to be skilled and experienced technical divers and therefore what they considered to be safe practice ought to have been given weight. Um, in relation to the risk assessment, uh, the inner house were far from clear why the evidence of Mr Cuthbertson as to the assessment carried out and the control measures implemented, namely the provision of handrails and the assistance of a deckhand, didn't meet the requisite standard of care. And that was particularly given the defender's role was limited to carrying out their own operations on board, to navigating with reasonable care and to providing a safe vessel for the dive. The inner house therefore found in favour of the defenders, overturning uh, the decision of the Lord Ordinary. Um, and the quote that you will now see on your screen, there we go, um, quite neatly encapsulates the approach taken in this case, this idea that there's a sense of unreality in an untutored skipper of a vessel being expected to devise a system. Um, the divers were far better placed than the skipper to decide upon what constituted a reasonably safe system of moving. And Mr Warner, who was well aware of what was an obvious and inherent risk, chose not to use the provided means. So what can we take from these cases um, so far as they relate to the adequacy of risk assessment? Well, in both cases, the court took, took a common sense approach uh, to risk and to the assessment of that risk. And I think what is also 
important to, to note about these cases is they're, they're good examples of the importance of considering the knowledge and experience of those affected by the risk. So if we look at Mackenzie, there was a presumption that the teacher would exercise common sense and also an acknowledgement that those organising the training and having and carrying out the risk assessment um, both had prior knowledge and experience in terms of both running the event and assessing the risk. And in Warner, the divers had a heightened knowledge of the potential risk of walking in fins. And they were not, I suppose, in that sense, to, to use that well-known phrase, the ordinary man. Um, and that was acknowledged by the court who accepted that they had that experience um, in terms of knowing what they were doing in terms of, of technical diving. Uh, perhaps, though, what these cases demonstrate above all is that sometimes, and, and it often tragically, an accident is, is simply an accident. Um, and that brings me to the end of um, risk assessments. Um, so I think over to back over to you, Laura, just for any any questions. Thanks, Katie. Um, so we have spoken to you now for um, our allotted 45 minutes. Um, we don't have any questions as yet. So as we said at the outset, if there are any questions that you think about after we've circulated the slides, we've covered quite a lot of ground today. We appreciate that. As we said um, at the outset, we really just wanted to touch on some areas that um, we know give our clients concern. Um, and if you want us to um, dig a bit deeper into those areas, any one of them, then let us know um, and we can do that. Close the webinar shortly. We have two more um, webinars still to come in this series, uh, one on costs um, on the 15th of November and um, then one on um, other cases that you need to know about that are relevant to personal injury claims in Scotland and that's on the 30th of November. So thank you and have a lovely afternoon.